I didn't recognize the number, so I answered in an official business tone. Dalton Conrad, I announced. Hey, Dalton, this is Judy Anderson. How are you? She asked in a pleasant voice. I felt a slight sense of guilt upon hearing her voice. I really wanted to invite them to a backyard barbecue or something, but I never got around to it. Hi, Judy. I'm fine. How are you, Carl and little Stephen? Everyone is fine, she replied. Listen, Carl's sister visited him last month. She has a gallery on State Street. Her name is Tracy. Yes, you mentioned it the day I brought the printout. Did you hang it up? I asked, not wanting to interrupt her. Of course I did. It's hanging on the back wall of our living room. We just love it, she said. I was a little surprised. I remembered her being a little shy in the park, and although there was absolutely nothing dirty or erotic about this picture, it showed almost all of her left breast, as well as part of her right. I thought they hung it in their bedroom, or maybe in the children's room. That's why I'm calling, Judy said. When Tracy saw it, she was delighted and said she loved the way you captured the innocence of the scene. She even suggested calling it the essence of innocence. Wow, I said, I love it. Yes, us too. Carl is going to make a small brass plate with this inscription and attach it to the wall under the picture. But there's one more thing I wanted to ask you. Tracy just called and asked if she could put this photo in her gallery for a while. She will, of course, indicate your name. I know you don't usually do this kind of photography, so I said I need to see if you have any objections before agreeing. Judy, the photo is yours. It's a gift. You can do whatever you want with it, but to answer your question. No, I don't have any objections. On the contrary, I'm flattered, I told her. Oh, Dalton, thank you. I was hoping you would say that. We've received so many compliments on this photo that I can't even tell you. Carl and I really want to thank you again. We will treasure her forever, she said with delight in her voice. Before this call, my days and nights simply melted into one dull moment after another. As they say, there is no joy in Mudville. Well, there has been no joy in Conradville either since I separated from my wife, except for this call. As an industrial photographer, I rarely get accolades, only money. It was very nice to hear from someone who appreciated my work so much. Another month passed, and it did not get easier, but rather more difficult. The more routine it became to return to an empty house, the more I hated it. I thought that maybe when it was all over, when I could start over, I would feel better. But now it was a waiting game. My whole life seemed to be in a state of uncertainty, and the closer the end of my marriage came, the more often I found myself at the bar in Plateau Place at the end of the day. Several of my friends told me that it would just take time. I guess they are right, but what to do until then? It was at this Plateau Place bar that I found some excitement. Although it was short-lived, it broke the monotony. I had been there for about an hour talking to Pete, my favorite bartender, when a guy we had both never seen before came in and sat down a couple of chairs away from me. He seemed sociable, so we struck up a friendly conversation until nature called. As you know, you don't buy beer, you rent it. I apologized to my new friend and went to the small room where all the men hang out from time to time. As I walked back, I noticed Pete talking to Big John, the bouncer, who had just arrived for his regular night shift. Judging by the expressions on their faces, they were discussing something important when John caught my eye and motioned for me to join them. Hi, John, I greeted him. What's happened? It was clear from their faces that something serious was happening. That guy at the bar, Pete said, nodding his head towards my new best friend. Yes, I said, not understanding what was being said. When I turned away and went to the other end of the bar, he put something in your drink, Pete told me. What? Are you sure? Yeah, I saw him in the mirror, Pete said, nodding toward one of the two mirrors in the corner of the ceiling. Through these mirrors, the bartender could see everything that was happening in the bar. I've never seen this guy before in my life. Why would he put something in my drink? I asked rhetorically. That's the $64 question, Big John whispered. Pete and I were just talking about what to do. Call the cops or take him to the bathroom and find out for ourselves. He looked at me as if he wanted me to tell him what to do, and I did. 
I would like to know what is happening, gentlemen. I vote for a little toilet persuasion. Then let's do it, Pete said. The stranger looked over his shoulder in our direction as we all walked towards him. He tried to run away, but Big John grabbed him before he could take three steps from his chair. We dragged him into the restroom to talk. At first he denied putting anything in my drink, but then Big John cracked his knuckles and the guy sang like a canary. It turned out that the drug was phenobarbital. When combined with alcohol, a person begins to feel dizzy and sleepy, making him look like someone who has had too much to drink. My new friend was to watch me, and when I began to exhibit such effects, he was to lead me to my car, where my old friend Irv Peterson was waiting. It seems that Irv was set on the promised revenge. Between the two of them, I would be doomed. What do you want to do, Dalton? Call the police, Pete asked me. I sighed. The problem is Peterson is just in denial. It's his word against this guy's word. Nothing will happen, and I'll have to keep looking over my shoulder. No, I want to end this right here and now, I said. None of us knew, of course, whether the guy we caught was a friend of Peterson's or just a hired man, but the general consensus was that no one trusted him, so Big John chained him to one of the toilets. We were going to turn him over to the police along with Peterson if everything went according to plan. They decided that I would stumble out into the parking lot alone and hope that Peterson would have the courage to try something. I tried to make everything as believable as possible, stopped and leaned on the door frame on the way out, then stopped and leaned on the fenders of several cars on the way to his own. I saw no sign of Peterson and thought he had lost his nerve, but continued his little game as he walked up to his car, fumbling with the key in the door lock. Finally, I saw the reflection of an approaching man in the side window of the car and turned around, trying not to leave the image. When I did this, he stopped five feet from me. He stood with a knife, not a very large knife. It was a pocket knife with a blade of about four inches, but still a knife. I saw the doubt on his face disappear as he watched my eyes droop and my body sway. His face broke into a wide smile as he took the next step that put him within reach. I quickly stepped forward with my left foot, then kicked with my right, hitting him in the shin as hard as I could. His reaction was typical, the knife falling out as he grabbed his leg with both hands, going into a forward somersault as soon as he hit the asphalt. I knelt down with my knee on his chest and threw four short punches to his face with my right hand. He was almost knocked out, but damn, this was the guy who ruined my life. I stood up and picked him up by his shirt before punching him in the stomach. He bent over at the waist with a loud groan. I straightened him out and aimed another good blow to the jaw. He flew back towards my car and slid back onto the asphalt. Big John watched from the corner of the parking lot in case something went wrong. He called the police from his cell phone before pulling me away from my alleged attacker. Once again, my long-standing relationship with the police worked to my advantage. I knew three of the six police officers who responded by name. With Big John as a witness, they arrested Peterson for assault with a weapon. This was not a minor offense, this time he would not be released on parole. He will have to post bail, and if he can't, he will remain in jail until his trial. The only thing that dimmed my pleasure in Irv's situation was that I thought about his wife and children. They were the innocent victims of all this. After testifying at the station, I returned home to soak my hand in ice water. It throbbed wildly and was very swollen. I wasn't even sure I could hold the camera for a while. The next day was Saturday. Summer had passed, and overnight it became completely cold. I wasn't in the mood for anything, and that's exactly what I did absolutely nothing. But the next day I decided it wasn't in my nature to wallow and feel sorry for myself for two days in a row, so I took a shower, went to Denny's for breakfast, and headed downtown in search of something interesting. I would most likely end up at the Lincoln Park Zoo, but I was still open to other suggestions from myself. I was getting off the highway when I remembered the art gallery that Carla's sister ran and wondered if my photograph was on display there. I didn't know the exact address, but I knew that the gallery was located downtown, on State Street, and it wasn't that hard to find. I was just wondering if it would be open on Sunday. In the end, I found it without much difficulty, and it was open. 
I was instantly captivated. The place was large and had an impressive assortment of impressive pieces of art on the walls. There was an easel with my photograph of Judy Wright in the middle of the room. Hoping to overhear the conversation, I joined several people standing around looking at her, but they moved away as soon as I approached. I was about to look at a couple of watercolors I noticed when I heard a woman's voice behind me. Stunning photo, isn't it? I turned around and almost gasped out loud. Standing in front of me was a beautiful woman with golden hair, bright blue eyes, and a smile that could melt a glacier. I heard what she said, but seeing this embodiment of beauty, my mind went blank, and I answered the sophisticated lady in a graceful, James Bond-like tone. Huh? Photograph, she repeated. This is my daughter-in-law, I think she's amazing. Her sister-in-law, so it was Carla's sister. I put my thoughts in order and spoke coherently. Yes, I agree, I said, deciding to tease her a little. You can't be in the art world without learning the psychobabble of an artistic colony. I stood back, pretending to look at the display. The whole scene looked so fresh and innocent. I love how the photographer used the morning light to highlight the hair and see how the light penetrates the fabric of her blouse. This gives the material a translucent appearance and bathes the center of the photo in a warm, glowing light. It can be seen that the photograph was taken with a telephoto lens, I believe a 300 millimeter one. Can you tell by the softness of the background? And then the corners of the photo were darkened so that the viewer's eye was focused on the essence of the image. She looked shocked at my critique. Wow, you're either a photographer, an artist, or a critic, she said, holding out her hand. I'm Tracy. Nice to meet you, I replied, gently shaking her hand. I'm Dalton Conrad. Her brows furrowed for a moment. I knew she was trying to remember the name. Dalton. It sounds. Are you a photographer? She revealed with surprise. No wonder you knew so much about the photograph, she laughed. Guilty, I admitted, laughing too. She must have felt the swelling on my arm. Still holding it, she turned it over to look. Yeah, I had a little accident the other day. It's much better now, I told her. We started talking, and I mentioned that I had seen a couple of watercolors that I wanted to see. She gave me a personal tour, talking about different artists and who she thought would be big in the future. We ended our walk in front of some watercolors that interested me. It turned out that her father wrote them. Damn it, Carl said his father was an artist, but I didn't know. I began, and my words trailed off. Is he still drawing? I asked. No, a few years ago, he developed Parkinsonism, which ended his career, she said sadly. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. He's extremely talented. What a pity he can't share his talent more, I said. I looked at two paintings, trying to decide which one to buy. Both were beautiful, and the thought of having one of them hanging in my home lifted my spirits. Finally, I chose one. I'll take this one, I said to my beautiful hostess. Is it true? she said, sounding a little surprised. I didn't think you were going to buy anything. I smiled. Well, to tell the truth, I just came to see if my photo was still there, but these works caught my attention as soon as I walked in. I knew I wouldn't leave here without one of these. She packed it up for safe delivery to its new home, and I felt truly good for the first time in a long time. It's funny, every time I looked at the picture, I saw Tracy's face in front of me. I was in a good mood for several days. Of course, nothing lasts forever. When I looked at the display of my ringing phone, I saw that Jean was calling. Hello, I answered in a neutral tone. Dalton, it's me. I just found out what happened. Are you okay? At first I thought she was saying that I bought the painting, but then I realized what she meant. Are you talking about the fact that your boyfriend attacked me with a knife? Yes, I. With a knife, she exclaimed. Oh God, I didn't know he had a knife. He just attacked you. Well, to be honest, it wasn't that big of a knife. I think it was an idea when he realized his friend wasn't around. There should have been two of them, but we chained his friend to a toilet stall until the police arrived. I heard her start crying. I'm so sorry, Dalton. It's all my fault, she sobbed. I guess things do get better over time. A few months ago, it would have hurt me to hear Jean cry like that. Now, 
Well, I can't say that I enjoy it, but it certainly didn't have the same effect on me as before. I knew that a lecture from me was the last thing she wanted to hear, but I didn't care she would get it anyway. Actions have consequences, Jen, because you were embarrassed to talk to your own husband about your sexual fantasies instead of some bastard, two families were destroyed. Think about it, not only have you and I lost each other, but a woman raising two teenagers alone now has to tell her sons that their father is going to jail. You told her how sorry you were, you should have. I heard her sobbing. If you get married again, Jean, I hope you've learned your lesson, I said before hanging up. Well, that's the end of my three-day good mood. My mood lifted again a couple of days later when Belle called me. We haven't spoken since we had dinner a few months ago. She was nice, not my type, but nice to talk to. So when she suggested a drink after work, I happily agreed. This time I arrived before her and was already sitting with a beer when she entered. Hey, Belle, I greeted her as I stood up as she slid into the booth across from me. One thing I've known about Belle since we last met is that she's not one for small talk. She gets straight to the point. What the hell did you say to Jean the other day? Was she still crying the next morning? That's how she started our conversation. A, I tried to remember. She kept apologizing to me. I told her that she owed Irv's wife and children an apology. Belle pulled back a little. She was just about to say something when the barmaid interrupted us. She ordered white wine and waited for the girl to leave before she attacked me again. Damn it, Dalton, I know what she did. Big time, but she's very vulnerable right now. If you attack her like that again, you might completely destroy her, she said. Belle, I'm not trying to destroy anyone. Well, maybe Irva, but only him. But she must take responsibility for her actions. She takes it, Dalton. I bet you don't even know what she told the prosecutor, right? To the prosecutor? I asked. No, I haven't heard from him yet. And you won't hear. When the prosecutor decided he was really going to prosecute her. They decided so. I didn't know that. Police said it was highly unlikely. Why didn't they tell me? I asked. Damn, she seemed to know all the answers. Because it didn't go that far, Jean was assigned a public defender. He told her to plead not guilty. He said no judge would convict her of treason, but Jean said no. She went to the prosecutor and pleaded guilty. The judge awarded her 200 hours of community service. Belle, how do you know all this? I had to ask. My fiancé is a Cook County police officer assigned to the Dawes office, she answered. I looked at her left hand and noticed the ring for the first time. I knew he wasn't there the last time we saw each other. Sorry, I didn't notice, Belle. Congratulations, I said. She raised her hand so I could see better. Thank you, she replied with a wide smile. I know most of these guys. What's the lucky guy's name? I asked. Dave Quinn. Dave? I responded, thinking how small the world is. I've known Dave for many years. I know. As soon as he saw the name on the arrest report, he knew it was you. He didn't know I was working with your wife until he told me one of his friends was having marriage problems, and we started comparing notes. She took her first sip of wine. Anyway, my point is, Jin most likely could have gotten away with it, but she took responsibility, like you said. She is trying to atone. I didn't say anything. I just sat there, staring at the glass I was twirling in my hand, and let her words settle. She still loves you, you know. I nodded my head. Yes, I know, and to some extent I love her too, but we can never be a couple again, the wounds are too deep, I said. I know, she said with a slight sigh. And Jean too, and she accepted it, but that doesn't mean you have to keep hurting her, Dalton. God, she cried so hard after she hung up the phone that day that we all went to her office trying to calm her down. Even Beverly tried to help. She was so upset that we all knew she needed to go home, but no one wanted her to drive. Mr. Jacobson came in and told me to take her home. Dalton, she's in terrible shape. When I got her home, I helped her mother put her to bed, and then I sat and talked with her mom and dad for a while. She was going to call you on Monday about the fight, but her parents talked her out of it. They know how much you are suffering and were worried about what you would tell her. Of course, she called the next day anyway. 
Okay, I won't be so hard on her if we talk again, I promised. Seeing that she was satisfied with my statement, she leaned back in the booth and looked at me until a small smile appeared on her face. Now, she said playfully, tell me about the fight. I had to laugh before I began my story. I wondered how Irv must have felt knowing that so many people loved to hear about how he was being beaten. I told her the whole story. Do you know he's already free on bail? I asked Belle. No, I don't know, and I doubt it will come out any time soon, she said. The other guy, the one who tried to put something in your drink, is going to testify that Irv paid him to drug you. So Irv is charged with assault with a weapon, trying to stab you, and conspiracy to assault and battery. His bond is $100,000, and his wife doesn't want to sign the papers to mortgage the house. So it looks like old Irv will be in the cell for a while, she said, still smiling. Dave says the prosecutor has an ironclad case, and he thinks Irv will get three to five years. I didn't care about Irv, but I still felt sorry for his wife and children. I also couldn't help but feel sorry for Jean. No matter how hard our divorce was for me, it seemed that she was suffering even more. A few days after talking with Belle, I realized that I had a couple of free hours between jobs. I knew Jean would be at work, so I went to talk to her parents. She had her own apartment, but her parents didn't want her to be alone, so they persuaded her to stay with them for a little longer. They told me almost the same thing as Belle. She was in terrible shape. She goes to work every weekday and returns home immediately afterwards. She never stops for drinks with the girls, doesn't talk to anyone on the phone or goes out for the evening. The only time she leaves the house on weekends is to go shopping with her mother. I asked if there was anything I could do to help other than take her back. They said no. They were confident enough. They finally managed to persuade her to go to bereavement counseling. Between that and their love and support, they thought she could handle it. They also expressed regret for her actions and said that they would always love me like a son. It was nice to hear that. I reminded them that Jean would not receive his copy of the final ruling in another three weeks. They said they knew. I was glad to hear that they had arranged for her to leave for a week and were going to take her with them to visit friends in Fort Lauderdale. Jean loved the ocean and the beach. Perhaps this was exactly what she needed to spice up her life again. When I left, I wondered if I should do the same, just book tickets somewhere and go. The problem is that I had a busy schedule for several months in advance, and there was no way I could do it. The day our divorce became final, I worked like crazy, trying not to think about it. After work, Jack and a few other friends surprised me by dragging me out of the house and into a gentleman's club. The next thing I knew, I was waking up on Jack's couch with his kids playing cowboys and Indians around me guess who was the Indian. The following month, I received a subpoena to appear as a prosecution witness in the state of Illinois v. Peterson case. The trial lasted only three days. Dave was right. This was a one-two punch for the prosecutor. Irv was sentenced to three to five years at the Danville Correctional Center, a medium security prison. It was all over. I could close this chapter of my life and move on, but how to do that? I decided a vacation was a good idea. I returned home and looked at my schedule again. In addition to scheduling myself, I also had an agency book the work for me. They received 20% of everything they offered. Between the two of us, my calendar was booked until September, several months in advance. Well, better late than never, I thought, this will give me something to look forward to. I blocked that week and told the agency to do the same. Now all I had to do was decide where to go and what to do. Oh well, I've had time to think about it. Life got pretty dull after that. I might have a drink with a friend every now and then, but mostly it was to get up, go to work, come home and go to bed. I didn't have much of a social life. I hated even thinking about jumping into the dating pool again. As is typical for Chicago, it was 45 degrees one spring day and 82 the next, and summer was here. Damn, I thought, Memorial Day is less than two weeks away, and I haven't made any plans. I usually had a party in the yard with all of our friends and family, but in truth, Jean was the one who organized it all. My heart trembled slightly when I thought about her for the first time in a long time. I wonder how she is doing, 
Is she lonely like me? I guess my friends had already figured out that I wasn't going to throw a party, so by the end of the week I had three invitations to events over Memorial Day weekend. Jack was hosting a small barbecue on Sunday, which was great because it left me free to attend Carl and Judy Anderson's barbecue on Monday. I was hoping Tracy would be there. When I arrived, I recognized a couple of neighbors, but was disappointed not to see Tracy around. I walked around with a beer in my hand, talking to a few people I knew in the area, but I felt out of place since everyone had a spouse. Finally, not knowing what else to do, I volunteered to be the official grill cook. It would be my job if I had my own party. Carl readily agreed, and here I stand, handing out burgers and hot dogs on warmed buns to everyone. I was flipping a new batch of burgers when something landed on my ear. I shook my head and at the same time tried to shake it off with my hand, but it came back. This time I slapped it, hitting myself in the ear. I'll be damned if the damn thing doesn't come back. I was about to spank myself to death, trying to kill the thing when I heard laughter behind me. Suddenly my whole day lit up when I turned around and saw Tracy with that same gorgeous smile and the feather she apparently found on the ground. Hello, sailor, she said seductively. Is there really a problem? She gathered a small audience who had a good laugh at my expense, but I didn't care. My heart began to pound from her mere presence. No, my problems are as light as a feather, I said, trying to come up with something witty. Ah, she said, nodding toward the grill. You better turn the rest until they're as black as charcoal. Oh, yes, I said embarrassedly, turning around. So how do you like yours? I'm not picky, anyone will do, she answered. I chose the biggest and best and gave it to her. She thanked me and went to look for somewhere to sit. I found Carl and told him I needed to take a break. I grabbed a burger for myself and found Tracy. May I? I asked. Please, she said patting the blanket-covered ground next to her. I hope you don't mind that I had a little fun at your expense, but I had to get back at you for teasing me that day in the gallery. I laughed and assured her that everything was fine. I think it was the first time I laughed in months. As the day passed, this laughter became more frequent. Damn, I was having a great time, and I think she was too. We just coincided. We talked about art, photography, dance, cinema, and things we still want to do. One of her plans for the future was a trip to the Monterey Peninsula in Northern California. She was there as a child with her father, remembered the scenery as breathtaking, and vowed to return there someday. I was very sorry to see the setting sun. I wanted this day to last forever. As night fell and the crowd began to thin out, I realized that we would soon have to part ways. Should I ask her for her number or just go to the gallery again? Damn it, I hated being indecisive, but I hadn't tried to win a woman in years. Do guys still ask for a girl's phone number these days, or is it too old-fashioned? She was about to leave, and I hesitated, not knowing what to do. It must have been obvious because she took pity on me. She reached into her purse and pulled out a pen and one of her business cards. This is my mobile, she said writing the number on the back of the card. I had a great time today. Call me if you want to go somewhere. She handed me a card and said that she would say goodbye one more time before leaving. I did the same, saying goodbye to the few people I knew and to the hosts, telling them what a great time I had and thanking them for the invitation. Shaking Carl's hand, I leaned closer to him so that no one would hear. You might be the first guy she's been interested in in a long time he told me quietly. Take action. I smiled and thanked him. Tracy and I met again as we were both getting ready to leave. I walked her to the car. Damn it, I wanted to kiss her, even just a light kiss on the cheek, but I was scared to death. I think she read my mind again. Sometimes I imagine it's like reading my first school reading book. Tracy stood up on her tiptoes and kissed me on the cheek. Call me, she said, pulling away from the sidewalk. The house was four blocks away. Not once did my feet touch the ground. The next day I was about halfway through filming my second assignment of the day when I got a call from Jack. Hey buddy, do you have time for a drink tonight? Jack, I have nothing but time lately, I replied. He was sitting at the bar next to an empty chair when I entered. Hi, Pete, 
I said to my favorite bartender. Miller Light, please. I'll bring it now, he replied. So, buddy, how are things going? How is your personal life? Asked Jack. Eh, well, it doesn't exist yet, I said. Dude, you need to get back into the swing of things, Dalton. Sitting at home alone every evening is for the birds. You are an attractive, successful guy with a great character. Use it, buddy. What about that girl from the gallery you were talking about? He noticed how a smile spread across my face. Yeah, that means there is some kind of interest. Have you seen her since that day in the gallery? I saw her yesterday, to be honest. Her brother invited me to a barbecue, and she was there. She really is a wonderful woman. We talked all day and never ran out of things to talk about, I told him. Did you ask her out on a date? No, I said, shaking my head. I would like to, but... Oh, I don't know. After this whole thing with Jean, it seems too early to start dating. Bullshit, Jack said enthusiastically. Look, I've never experienced anything like what happened to you, but I imagine it must be devastating to your self-confidence. It's completely natural, but it just means you have to get back on your horse and ride. I didn't say anything. I just let Jack's words sink into my mind. If only it were that simple, I thought. Does she like Shakespeare? asked Jack. Shakespeare? I don't know, we didn't talk about this yesterday. Why? Well, you like Shakespeare, I know you do. Hell yes, I adore him. What are you getting at? I asked. Jack pulled four tickets from his shirt pocket. They were at the play Julius Caesar, which was shown at the Shakespeare Theater this Friday. An entertainment columnist gave them to me the other day. I'm not a fan, but Lynette is a fan. Anyway, I know you like it too. Why don't you call the girl from the gallery and ask her out? Let's set up a double date. My head was in a whirlwind of thoughts. On the one hand, it sounded perfect. On the other hand, what if she refuses? I remembered Carl telling me she was interested, and she herself told me to call. Is it worth the risk? I looked at the tickets, then at Jack. He had a smug smile on his face, as if he was saying, well, well, go ahead, try to get out of this. Damn it, I was going to take the risk. I had already programmed Tracy's number and the gallery number into my cell phone. I pulled it out and typed it. Hello, her voice sounded so loud that I could feel her smile right through the phone. Suddenly, I became nervous again. Hi, it's, um, it's me. Um, I mean, it's Dalton, Dalton Conrad, I finally managed to say. Hey Dalton, wow, it didn't take you long. I mean to call me. It sounded reassuring, I took a deep breath. Well, I found a topic that we didn't talk about yesterday, and I, um, I wanted to know if you like Shakespeare. Well, I mean, Shakespeare's plays? Are you kidding? Of course I adore Shakespeare. Jack must have heard her answer because I saw a wide smile appear on his face. My heart began to beat faster. I took a deep breath again. My friend has four tickets to see Julius Caesar this Friday night. The performance is staged at the Shakespeare Theater on Navy Pier. It will be you and me, my friend and his wife. Would you be interested? I asked, holding my breath. If she says no, I'll die right here on the bar stool, I thought. That sounds like fun, I'd love to go, she said. I expected a but, but it didn't come. I smiled and nodded my head, indicating her agreement to Jack. Great, I said, almost too enthusiastically. Starts at eight. Wait, Jack said, nudging me to get my attention. Um, wait a second, Tracy. I looked at Jack to see what he wanted. How about dinner before the performance? Can she be ready by six? We can stop by the little general. We'll do everything right, he said. Damn, great idea, I thought. Tracy, could you be ready by six? We can all have dinner together before the performance. Of course, she answered happily. What is the dress code for the evening? I told her to just dress nicely. An evening dress is not necessary. This was my first real date in years. To say I was nervous would be an understatement. I was glad Jack volunteered to drive because I'm sure I would have ended up on someone's lawn that night. Jack drove up to the building where Tracy lived and I got out to ring the bell. What happened next almost seemed like a dream. A wet dream, in fact, that's exactly how I would have described Tracy when she walked outside. 
a walking wet dream. Her silky blonde hair fell loosely over her shoulders and softly framed her sparkling blue eyes. The fabric of her short blue off the shoulder dress showed just the right amount of cleavage and hugged every curve like a Formula One car at Indy. She literally took my breath away. Tracy, you look amazing, I said. She smiled and kissed me on the cheek. Thank you, Dalton. I'm glad you called. I was looking forward to this evening, she said. Jack and Lynette got out of the car to meet each other. I had to laugh as we all got back into the car. Put your eyes back in your head, I heard Lynette say quietly to Jack with a playful slap on the arm. Dinner was great with lots of laughter and good conversation. Tracy was so refined that by the time we finished our meal, it felt like we had all been friends for years. I could see that Jack and Lynette felt the same way and really liked her. The evening started out unseasonably warm, but anyone who's ever been on the Chicago waterfront will tell you it can get cold in the blink of an eye. Halfway through the piece, the wind shifted to the north, and the temperature must have dropped 20 degrees in five minutes. It was the perfect opportunity to show off my gentlemanly qualities. I took off my sports coat and draped it over Tracy's shoulders, then hugged her. She snuggled close to me, and we watched the rest of the performance, keeping each other warm. I was in pure heaven. As the evening drew to a close, it seemed to me that Tracy was just as reluctant to end it as I was. It was a little after midnight when we brought her home. She thanked Jack and Lynette in the car, and then I walked her to the door. Thank you, Dalton. I had a great time today, she said with a smile. Does this mean I can call you again? I'll be angry if you don't call, she replied. Like I said, it's been a while since I've been on a date. I was also a little embarrassed knowing that I had an audience, but I wanted to kiss her all night and was going to try. My fear must have been obvious as I began to lean forward because Tracy didn't wait. She put her hand behind my head and pulled me into a passionate kiss. Our tongues mingled as she pressed herself against me. After the kiss, I promised to call her the next day, then walked back to the car. Dalton, I turned when she called out to me. Don't forget this, she said, taking my sports coat off my shoulders. Oh yes, thank you, I said, taking it from her hand. You might need it, she said with a knowing smile and a wink. Anyone who heard her would think she meant because of the temperature, but I knew she meant that it would hide the bulge in my pants. Damn, what an evening. If after the party I walked on air, then after Friday I was on the moon. We went on six more dates over the next month. Without sex, we walked slowly and got to know each other. We were back at her apartment after our date on Friday when she told me she wanted me to pick her up from the gallery at five o'clock the next day. She told me not to make plans that evening, but didn't say why. Well, who am I to argue? I was there exactly at five, she was just locking the door when I showed up. She invited me in and said she had a couple things to do in the back room before we could go and asked if I would wait a minute. I walked around the gallery looking at the various paintings and was disappointed to see that someone had bought another painting of her father that I liked. I was going to buy it myself. Dalton, could you come here and help me, please? I heard her scream from the back room. I'm coming, I answered. Surprise! Everyone screamed when I walked through the door. I was stunned. Most of my friends were there, plus Carl and Judy and a few others I didn't know. What's happening? I muttered. Tracy came up to me with a big smile and hugged me. Happy birthday, Dalton, she said before kissing me passionately. I had to think. Oh yeah, my birthday is next Monday. How did you know? I asked. I found information about you on the internet, dear. You would be surprised how much information there is about you, she replied. I called Jack, and he made sure to invite your friends for me. It was too much. Jean threw me a couple of little birthday parties when we were married, but never a surprise like this, nothing like this. I also noticed that this was the first time she called me darling. I was stunned. Most people just gave cards, but some even gave gifts. I opened them and thanked everyone. Tracy hid hers until the last minute. It was obvious that it was a painting, but I didn't know which one until I unfolded it. It was another painting of her father that I wanted. I literally had to stop myself from crying. I was so shocked. 
The party could have gone on all night, but we wanted everyone to be sober when they left. So Tracy called it quits at 8 p.m. I helped clean up after everyone left. As we were finishing up, Tracy had another surprise for me. Dalton, I thought I'd go home with you and help you hang this, she said, pointing to the painting. Besides, Angie opens for me in the morning, so I have the whole night to myself, she said with a sparkle in her eyes. Angie was her assistant. Wow, this is really going to happen. It's been a few months since I walked into the gallery and first met Tracy. I remember how my heart skipped a beat, but I didn't even dare think about a possible relationship at that time. Who would have thought what awaits us in the future and that she would make me so happy? When we got to my house, we actually hung the picture. It looked great on the wall next to the other. That's when I started to panic again. I asked Tracy if she wanted something to drink. I thought I played polite, but apparently it was obvious that I was taking my time. Tracy looked at me as if she was studying my face. You're not ready yet, are you? I wasn't sure what she meant. Excuse me. Judy told me about your divorce, I'm sorry. I can only imagine how hard it was to go through this. The closest I came to this was when I discovered that my fiancé was cheating on me a month before the wedding. It broke me. I wanted you from the moment you walked into the gallery, but I wanted to wait until I felt you were ready for this kind of commitment. I thought you were ready, but maybe I was wrong. I was stunned. I didn't know that Judy or anyone else other than a few friends and family knew about my divorce. I know not much time has passed if you're uncomfortable with me being here. She left her words hanging in the air. I think she was waiting for me to say something, but I was still shocked that she knew about Jean. You should probably take me home, she said. No, no, please. Sorry if I seem indecisive. It's just, well, you're the first woman in this house since she left. I think I'm just a little nervous. She looked at me. She seemed to be deciding whether to stay or go. Finally, she smiled. Did you say something about drinking to a girl? Of course, I said, coming out of my stupor. What would you like? A glass of cold water would be nice, she said. Cold water, I'm coming. Here, I pointed to the sofa. Sit where you can see your father's paintings, and I'll be right back. I walked into the kitchen, mentally cursing myself. What the hell am I doing? Why did these feelings of uncertainty arise again? I took a deep breath and poured a glass of cold water from the refrigerator. One more deep breath to gain courage. Here, I said, handing Tracy the glass. Do you want to talk about it? She asked. I'm a good listener. No, I appreciate the offer, but I would rather talk about you. We always had something to talk about on dates, but she rarely talked about herself, about personal things. She talked a little about her childhood and how much she admired her father and his talent. He gave her money to open a gallery. Of course, it was she who made her successful. I adored him, she said. I still adore his talent, his passion for beauty. It just breaks my heart to see him now. He was always so cheerful, always smiling and joking. He is now wheelchair-bound and has lost so much control of his arms that he can't even hug me. I saw her fight but lost the battle with the tears coming. I'm so sorry, dear. All this time, you haven't talked about your parents very much, and I didn't want to ask because this topic always seemed sad to you, I said, hoping that she would open up. Is your mother alive? Tracy nodded her head. Yes, and she still takes care of Dad. She refuses to put him in a nursing home. It's so hard for her, but you can't even talk to her about it. She will just look at you and tell you that he is her husband and she will never leave him. That's when a single tear broke through and rolled down her cheek. She wiped it off and, to my surprise, continued to open up to me. She spoke about her two long-term relationships. The first was with a guy she met during her sophomore year of college. They were together for two years, but soon after graduation they simply separated. The second was with the man to whom she was engaged. He was a young real estate talent who quickly rose to the ranks of the big money selling commercial real estate. She fell head over heels in love with him, and after three years of dating, he proposed to her. She said she was almost embarrassed to wear her wedding ring because it was so big. She told me that it was the happiest time of her life, but then disaster struck. 
She found out that he had been cheating on her for a year with his secretary. She was crushed. It's been four years since she broke off the engagement, but even after all this time, I could see her fighting back tears while talking about it, and because of that experience, she was very careful not to get too attached to anyone, or since then. So now you know the story of my life, she said. Sad, but true. If you're planning on running, now is probably the time. I was losing my resolve. Less than a year ago, when I filed for divorce, I told myself that it would be a long time before I opened my heart to another woman. But here I sit, almost hypnotized, listening to this beautiful, strong, confident lady. Over the past four years, she's held up her guard, protected herself from pain, and here she is, letting down her guard and letting me in, trusting me with her vulnerability. Could I do the same for her? I'm not going anywhere, I said. She smiled, came closer to me, and kissed me tenderly on the lips. I have a confession, she said when our lips parted. I think I had a little crush on you before we even met. I probably looked puzzled. Only because I was, though. Her smile widened, and she continued. It happened when I first saw your picture of Judy. One look, and I realized that the photographer is a kind, compassionate, romantic person with the soul of a poet. Now that I have gotten to know you better, I see that I was right. But you also have an inner strength that I admire, a strength that has allowed you to survive hardships and come out the other end with courage and determination. Wow. I said modestly. You make me look like some kind of Superman. Maybe you are, she joked, lightly running her fingers along the inside of my thigh. She looked into my eyes. Are you a man of steel? She asked with a devilish expression on her face. Well, at least one part of me might fit that description, I replied with the same devilish expression. She kissed me, our tongues intertwined like two dancing fairies. I hope you're not faster than a bullet she said with a laugh, already starting to unbutton the top button of my shirt. I wanted to do this from the moment you first walked into the gallery. We continued to kiss as she slowly undid each button. I closed my eyes, lost in eroticism, when I felt her hand gently stroking my pectoral muscles. Nice torso, she whispered. I wonder if she felt how hard my heart was beating. I took her hand and stood up. I stood behind her as she joined me. I kissed the back of her head and behind her ear while I unbuttoned her blouse. When it opened at the front, I discovered that she was wearing a bra with a front clasp, and I felt the firmness of her breasts when I released them. She moaned and leaned back, resting her head on my shoulder as I continued to bite her long, beautiful neck. She reached back with her left hand and slid it between us, feeling my fully expanded manhood. Take me to bed, Dalton, she whispered seductively. I want you to love me, she whispered. Let's go, I said, taking her hand and leading her up the stairs. For a moment I was struck with guilt. The only person I ever made love to in that bed was Jean. This thought completely disappeared when I took Tracy into my arms. I slowly finished undressing her. With each clothing removed, her chiseled body was revealed more and more. She was great. We lay naked on the bed that had been so lonely for months. Her reaction to my kisses was immediate and exciting, as she moaned and squirmed under the gentle touch of my lips. Her breathing quickened. Do I need a condom? I blurted out. She shook her head from side to side. We lay huddled together, trying to catch our breath. Tracy was the first to speak again. Wow, she said, still a little out of breath. Happy birthday, Mr. Kent or can I call you Clark? We both giggled, too tired to laugh. Miss Anderson, you can call me whatever you want, I replied, finally regaining the ability to speak. She stayed the night. It's hard to describe how wonderful it felt to wake up with someone in my arms, especially someone as wonderful as Tracy. The next morning, I was the first to wake up. He quietly put on his robe and tiptoed down the stairs to the kitchen. I wanted to bring her breakfast in bed, but she ruined my plan with her presence while I was still whisking eggs. I saw her out of the corner of my eye and turned around. She was leaning on the door frame, smiling and wearing one of my shirts. I swallowed so hard that I felt my Adam's apple move. What a sight. I hope you don't mind. I didn't bring a robe with me, she said, 
making the kitchen even hotter than it already was. There's not a man in this world or any other who wouldn't mind seeing you like this, I muttered. I heard her bare feet on the tile floor as she came up behind me. I smiled from ear to ear when she hugged my chest and laid her head on my back. God, it's been a long time since I felt such tenderness. We finished breakfast and went upstairs to make love again. When we were both finally completely exhausted, we took a shower together and realized that we weren't actually as tired as we thought. We finally ran out of steam when the hot water ran out. It was already two o'clock in the afternoon when we got dressed for the first time that day. We went to eat and then came back to my place. Damn, I didn't want this day to end. I knew I would have to take Tracy home soon. My heart was already starting to ache just thinking about it. The western sky was just beginning to glow with pastel colors when I asked if she had time to sit with me on the veranda and watch the sunset before leaving. She snuggled up to me and put her head on my shoulder, and I hugged her. We sat in silence for a few minutes, watching the blues, yellows, and oranges merge into each other in this stunning natural light show. I didn't know it, but we were both deep in our thoughts. I realized that I was falling in love with her. I was going to tell her about it, but she beat me to it. Dalton, were you really serious yesterday when you said I was amazing? Of course, Tracy, you are an amazing woman. Since she herself opened this topic, I decided to tell it like it is. I know we've only known each other for a few months, but... Yes, she asked, looking into my face. Well, I... I... I'm falling in love with you, Tracy. She just kept looking at me. Without frowning, without smiling, she just watched. What if there is something that doesn't seem so surprising to you, she finally said. What if I have a secret that you might find perverted, or at least not like? Her face suddenly became serious, almost frightened. I suppose I looked surprised. What was she talking about? She did not wait for the question and continued. Dalton, I'm falling in love with you too, but I have a secret that I'm afraid to reveal because it could ruin our relationship before it even begins. But I also understand that relationships cannot be built on lies. I saw tears begin to appear in her eyes. I wiped one of them with my thumb. I couldn't imagine that this woman had such a terrible secret that could change my feelings for her. I smiled at her encouragingly and kissed her tenderly. Whatever this deep secret is, honey, I said, I'm sure I can handle it. She looked scared. Cautiously, she spoke again. Well, I kind of... I mean, in my work world, I'm always in charge, and sometimes... She stopped and just looked at me for a few seconds. Oh shit, I'll just say it and pray. So you don't think I'm some kind of pervert. I love being tied up. In bed, I mean, not always, but sometimes I like to be tied up and dominated, helpless and unable to stop my lover from taking over my body in any way he wants, she said sharply and then stopped to see how I would react. It stunned me, with all these hints and prefaces. She was so scared just like my ex-wife. Only Tracy found the courage to tell me. I knew what I was doing was wrong. She didn't know the details of what happened between Jean and me, very few did. But I couldn't help myself, I burst out laughing. Tracy looked terrible, she thought I was laughing at her. I gave her a quick hug and reassured her that that wasn't the case, then told her how Jean was tied up in the motel when she was arrested, and how she was afraid to talk to me about her fantasies and ended up with Irv instead of me. I told Tracy that I didn't think she was a pervert, but rather that I admired her. I said that I appreciated how difficult it was for her to admit this, and how much I was overwhelmed by the feeling that she was trusting me with her secret. If Jean trusted me as much as Tracy did, we'd still be married. I admit, I've never tried anything like this, but if you don't mind a beginner, then I'd like to try, I admitted. Finally. She illuminated my soul with her smile again. God, how I hated the thought of waking up to an empty bed again after this morning, but she had things to do at home before the gallery opened the next day. I didn't think about it all weekend, but I also had to get up early. Birthday or not, when you work for yourself, there are no paid days off. If I don't work, I don't earn money. The first thing I did when I got back and dropped Tracy home was turn on my laptop and find some bondage sites. 
I've never been into sexual erotica. I just didn't consider sex a spectator sport. For me, it was either full contact or nothing. So it didn't really surprise me that the photos didn't turn me on. In fact, I ended up criticizing their shooting techniques. Poor, direct, single flash lighting, poor composition, overexposed, underexposed, terrible color saturation. Damn, if there's so much money in this business, why can't they afford a real photographer? I found literally hundreds of sites and started jumping from one to another. It turns out that I learned more from reading stories about wild sex than from looking at pictures. Some of them I thought were over the top, and I hope Tracy wasn't interested in going to such extremes, but there were also things that I thought could be very funny. I even felt excited reading about them. Hmm, maybe this will work, I thought. I wasn't due to see Tracy until the middle of the week, so every night when I got home I researched and read about different techniques for rough sex. By Wednesday evening, I was confident that I knew enough to at least ignite her passion for being tied up and submissive. I prepared a little surprise for her when I arrived at her apartment. It was in my pocket. She greeted me at the door with a big kiss and an even bigger smile. God, she felt so good in my arms. Where are we going, dear? Is this suitable for clothing? She asked, spinning around so I could see her cute little summer dress fluttering. I told her on the phone that we were going to dinner, but I didn't say where. Hold still, I said in a commanding voice. She looked a little surprised, but did as I said. Don't move, I said, walking around behind her. I slowly unbuttoned her dress and pushed it off her shoulders, letting it fall to her feet. What you... Oh, no talking until I say you can, I said, lightly slapping her beautiful panty-covered ass. Spread your legs, I demanded, lightly spanking her again. Ooh. She realized what was happening, and I felt her breathing getting heavier. I leaned close to her ear and whispered, That's what you like, isn't it? Oh, yes, she moaned. What? I said sternly. Yes, sir, she moaned, quickly catching on. It was incredible. I've never had such pleasure before. When she finished, my beautiful submissive girlfriend wrapped her arms around my waist and pressed her cheek against my stomach. Thank you, Dalton, she said quietly. You have no idea what this means to me. I needed to sit down and rest for a while while she put on her dress and fixed her makeup. We went to a small Italian restaurant that I had heard about. As the head waiter showed us to the table, he pulled out a chair for Tracy. She was a little quiet while we ate, and I started to wonder if she liked it. Just as I was about to ask, she looked at me with a wide smile. I'm not sure I can wait until we get home, she said seductively. I might have to crawl under the table and give you one more pleasure right here before we leave. I think this answered my question. Well, she was able to hold it in until we got back, but as soon as we walked through the door, she turned and pounced on me giving me one of the most passionate kisses I've ever received. I hope you're going to stay the night, because there's no way I'm letting you go tonight, she said firmly. I didn't think about staying the night, but why not? We experimented with a few more games, and then I made love to her again. The sun was already rising when we fell asleep, hugging each other. We only slept for about three hours, but those three hours were filled with real rest and we both woke up bright and energized the next morning. That night was the real beginning of us. From then on we became a couple. We spent every free minute together. We often played dominance role plays, but we weren't always in the mood for it, and most of the time we just made love. Before we knew it, summer came to an end. I looked at my calendar and saw that I had nothing planned for the first week of September. Damn, I completely forgot about my vacation plans. When I mentioned this to Tracy, her eyes lit up. Let's go on vacation together. I didn't even think about it because I didn't think she would want to close the gallery. I'm training Angie. She's quite capable of running a gallery for a week. What do you say? She asked, completely delighted. Where are we going? In Monterey. Obviously, I had seen photographs of this coastline myself, and just the thought of it sparked creative inspiration in me. If we go, do you mind if I take one of my cameras and take some pictures while we're there? I asked. Against? Are you kidding? Honey, that's the whole point. 
Just imagine what someone with your talent can do with such a landscape. The next day, I booked our flight to Auckland and rented a car. After a couple of weeks, Tracy gave Angie some final instructions, and we were on our way. By the time we arrived, it was too late to do anything other than eat dinner and play a bit before bed, but the next morning we headed south along the Pacific coast early in the morning. It didn't take long before we were both in awe of the breathtaking views of the California coast. Once I found a parking spot, I grabbed the camera and stuck the spare battery in my pocket before Tracy, and I walked down to the sea. I was like a kid in a candy store. Every time I brought the camera to my eyes, I was able to compose another breathtaking shot. Tracy and I spent the entire day photographing the Monterey Peninsula. It wasn't until the sun set and we had lost all light that we realized we hadn't even had lunch. We found a motel, checked in, showered, and were famished when we were seated at the restaurant. We were both still in awe of all the photos we had taken. The next day we packed lunch before heading out again. I talked Tracy into posing in a bikini for some of the shots. When we found a secluded little cove hidden away from everyone, I had to promise that these pictures would be for my private collection only before she agreed to take off her bikini. When I first saw this magnificent coastline, I didn't think anything could rival its magnificence, but seeing my woman naked against the backdrop of these prehistoric natural wonders was a truly spiritual experience. I proved this, showing her how part of my body rushed to the heavens, after which we spread the blanket on the sand and made love to the rhythm of the waves hitting the shore. On the fourth day, I found an isolated place that led me to think. Later that evening, I told Tracy that I needed to run to the store for something and asked her to stay in the motel room while I was gone. She questioned me, but did not argue. I knew where to go and returned within 40 minutes with my purchase hidden in my camera bag for the next day. Early the next morning, we found another fantastic spot from which to capture another magnificent sunrise. We continued to find and shoot one stunning seascape after another until midday. We found a quiet place not far from the secret place I had spotted the day before. What's the matter, dear? Are you not in the mood? Tracy asked when I answered differently than usual. Oh, I'm in the mood, baby, but I have a little surprise around the corner, I told her in my dom voice. I should have known when you left last night, she said with a chuckle in her voice. I raised one eyebrow and gave her my evil, malicious, whiplash laugh. After lunch we walked around the large boulders and entered the canyon I had seen the day before. An old tree grew on a rocky cliff, its branches twisted and twisted over time by the ancient winds of the sea. I moved around, photographing the majestic landscape from all angles. When I realized that I had what I was looking for, I put the camera in its case and took out a long black piece of silk fabric. I'm sorry, baby, but this is where night falls for your beautiful eyes, I said as I tied the headband around her head and tied it at the back. I reached into my suitcase again, this time for the rope I bought. I accompanied my beautiful submissive under the tree. She gasped in anticipation as I tied her wrists tightly, but not too tightly. I threw the rope over the main branch of the tree and lifted her arms up, stretching them high enough above her head to make her body tense. I tied the other end to the lower branch. Looking at my craft, I wondered if nature created this cove for this very purpose. Now stay here and be a good girl, I'll be back soon. I saw the look of sheer horror on her face and realized that she thought I was going to leave her for a moment. Don't worry, baby, I'm not going anywhere, you just won't feel my hands on you for a couple of minutes. I saw her smile until she heard the sound of my camera shudder, her face turned to horror again. Expensive, I mean, sir, you won't photograph me like this, please no. Hey, 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 I said in an even voice, walked up to her and gently stroked her bare skin. Do you trust me? Trust me completely. Yes, of course, she said in a calmer voice. Then there shouldn't be a problem, I said, taking control again. You are right, sir, she said, regaining her smile. I am very sorry, sir. I think I just panicked for a second. I gently pressed my lips to hers. I love you, baby. I would never do anything to hurt you, I said. No one but you and me will ever see this, I promise. 
she felt completely at ease as I continued to take the most erotic photographs I had ever taken or ever hoped to take. Having released her, I threw off the blanket and took off my clothes. More than an hour passed before we came up for air. Towards the end of our last day, I looked up from the viewfinder and saw Tracy standing on the beach, just looking in one direction, when I looked closer and saw the sadness on her face. Honey, what's the matter? I was worried. Just minutes before we were laughing and joking, I had no idea what was causing her sadness. I remember this place, she said. This is the place. I stood right here when I was just seven years old and watched my father paint those rocks over there. He was so young then, so strong and full of life, she said, trying to hold back tears. Where was it installed? I asked. Right here, she pointed out, taking a few steps forward. Right here was his easel. I watched in amazement as he reconstructed God's wonderful creation in watercolor. She laid her head on my shoulder and cried when I put my arm around her. I continued to hold it for a few minutes until Tracy felt better, then stood right where her father stood all those years ago and digitally recreated his painting. There was something magical about this place. I felt it too. We sat on the beach, hugging each other, watching the sun slide beneath the stormy waves. Later that night there was no sex, no bondage, no lovemaking. I held her in my arms while she pressed herself against me. She needed the love and support of a strong man, and I prayed to the man above, thanking him for the opportunity to be that man. The next day, unfortunately, we went home. It was just before noon in Chicago when we left the O'Hare garage. In my pocket were eight flashcards with over 1,300 photographs. Tracy was even more excited than I was about the prospect of editing and selecting the best photos. Since we planned to take some very large photographs of some of the frames, I set the camera to the highest quality image it could offer. As a result, we were unable to view the photos on my laptop. For this, I needed a computer, which I specifically configured for this kind of work. On the way home, we grabbed a quick bite to eat and then almost ran to my office to look at some footage. I pulled up an extra chair for Tracy and began loading the first card. After about a minute, photo thumbnails began appearing on my 27-inch monitor. Oh my God, Tracy almost screamed in my ear. Look at these things, honey. Every single one of them is incredible. Oh, how the hell are we supposed to choose one over the other here? She asked. I had to admit they were damn good. Of course, it was a creation of nature, but I captured it in all its glory. I know, Tracy exclaimed joyfully, kissing me on the cheek and hugging my neck. One personal show. What? What other solo show? Yours, stupid. Your personal show in my gallery. Oh God, honey, I'll put on an exhibition of your talent and you'll become the most famous and sought after photographer in Chicago. We will select 100 of the best photographs, if at all possible. You print them and I will frame them. What do you say? Before I could answer, a new thought occurred to her. We can also print several hardcover books, they will contain 20 photographs, and you can sign them. Oh dear, we're going to have the best show this city has ever seen. What do you think of the idea, my love? I watched her transformation in complete amazement as my warm, sensitive, sometimes submissive friend turned into the strong, confident businesswoman I saw when we first met. She grabbed her phone and was about to start organizing everything when she suddenly stopped. I think I looked a little doubtful. I made money as an industrial and commercial photographer, not as a seascape photographer. I was worried that this might somehow negatively impact my business. Sorry, dear, sometimes I get carried away. I didn't even ask if you wanted to do this yourself, did I? Tracy listened to my concerns and thought for a few minutes. Honey, just like you told me on the beach, I love you and I would never do anything to harm you. If it's something that bothers you, we'll just forget the idea. But please think about this first. Personally, I think it will only strengthen your business. In fact, if we do decide to do this, I think we should send personal invitations to all of your clients so they can see that you are not only talented in one area, but that your talent as a photographer is limitless. I'm sure your clients will respect your work even more than they already do. She finished her speech, sat on my lap, put her arms around my neck, and kissed me. 
She was so confident that I couldn't resist. What size do you want the printouts to be? I asked with a smile. This is my man, she exclaimed. What is the largest size you can make? She got very excited when I told her that I could buy paper in rolls and make prints up to 44 inches wide. Tracy hit the ground running. She set the date for the 15th of October, which was a Saturday and only five weeks away. Every evening she and I selected the best shots. I made prints of different sizes, then she took them to work the next day and framed them. Of course, working late at my house gave her the opportunity to stay overnight while we organized all this. It was something I was getting very used to. Among other things, Tracy handled advertising, sending out personal invitations, and organizing the gallery. She was busy. When I agreed to the show, I had my own little idea. I made all the preparations myself without telling Tracy. After the gallery closed on the Friday before the exhibition, Tracy, as usual, put herself in high gear. She brought in her brother to help her. Angie and I get everything ready for the next morning. I asked Carl where Judy was. He said she was home with the baby, but they had a babysitter for Saturday, so she would be on the first day of the show. We ordered two pizzas and worked tirelessly until everything was ready a little before midnight. Since she had been staying with me since we returned from California, Tracy followed me home. We both should have been tired after all this work, but the truth is that we were still running on adrenaline. The next day was a big day, and we knew we needed to sleep, but we were so excited, we needed to relax. Tracy was clearly in charge all night, giving everyone instructions on how she wanted everything arranged for the exhibition. No, not here there, it should go here, I want it hanging there. It's time for me to take control again. I arrived home a few minutes before her and had already prepared everything. It didn't take long, by the time she came in I was ready. As soon as she entered the dark living room, she realized that something was happening. Sir? She asked quietly. I activated the wireless remote in my hand. Instantly my laptop projector came to life, flooding the room with photos of my beautiful, naked slave in an erotic light show. Images of Tracy quickly appeared on the big screen, one after another, centrally tied up against the majestic backdrop of Monterey Bay. I heard her gasp as she saw herself for the first time. Her naked, slender body was taut, her arms were raised high above her head, reaching out to the tree twisted by the wind. I was waiting for her outside the door and approached her from behind. Yes, I said. Don't move, I ordered, unbuttoning her dress. She closed her eyes and tilted her head back as I ran my hands over her shoulders. How did you know, she whispered. How did you know that this was exactly what I needed today? SHH, I shushed her. No talking, you will do whatever I say, it's clear. Yes, master, she whispered again, her breathing quickening. I unclasped her bra and let it fall, her panties were next. Then the siblings played a little with tying. I untied her and took her to the bedroom where we slipped under the sheets for traditional lovemaking. A few minutes later she put me on alert again. For the next two hours we enjoyed each other as only two loving people can. The next day I woke up an hour before my alarm. I was too excited to go back to sleep. I didn't want to wake Tracy, so I carefully removed my hand from under her and showered in the hallway bathroom rather than the main bathroom. I put on my robe and went downstairs to make coffee. I had just sat down when Tracy joined me. Well, are you worried? She asked, standing again in one of my white shirts. Oh yes, I answered with a smile. Not about me, silly, she said, coming up and kissing me. I mean about your show today, she laughed. Oh, about that, I said with a grin. Yes, to be honest, I'm really excited. I walked over to the counter and poured her a cup of coffee. Here, beauty, I said, putting it on the table. Drink some coffee while I make us breakfast. How did you know that was exactly what I needed last night? She asked timidly. I don't know, I just knew, I answered. I didn't think much about it, but she was right. How did I know? I think the intimacy we shared as a couple was deeper than I imagined. I was attuned to her deepest feelings. Thinking about this, I smiled. I think Tracy was thinking about it too, judging by the wide smile on her face. 
We arrived at the gallery an hour before opening. Even though most everything had been done the night before, we still needed to make coffee, cool drinking water, and set out snacks. Angie arrived right after us, and Carl and Judy showed up a few minutes later. We opened the doors at nine o'clock, and I was amazed at the number of people waiting to come in. Almost instantly, the gallery was filled with oohs and ahs from impressed visitors. In the first 20 minutes, I had already sold $600 worth of photographs and signed two books. By 10 o'clock in the morning, when I began looking for Tracy's surprise, the gallery was filled to capacity. I watched carefully as a specially equipped SUV pulled up to the front door. Tracy was busy talking to someone when the large side door of the car opened and a man in a wheelchair was lowered onto the pavement using an electric lift specially designed for this purpose. I saw Tracy notice this out of the corner of my eye, but didn't realize what was happening until a pretty silver-haired lady came out of the passenger door and stood behind the seat. She began to push the man forward while the driver held the door for them. Mom, Dad, she screamed. Oh my God, everyone stopped and watched as Tracy ran to her mother and father with tears in her eyes, hugging and kissing them both. Several minutes passed before Tracy was able to speak out of emotion. How did you get here? This nice young man helped us, her mother said, pointing at me. Tracy looked at me with tears of gratitude. At this time, Carl and Judy, who were in the back room helping with something, came out to see what was going on. They also ran up and greeted their parents with hugs and kisses. Tracy talked many times about how she tried to get her father out of the house, but he was shy about his condition and didn't want anyone to see him like that. Tracy came over and hugged me while her brother took care of his parents. How did you do it? How did you persuade him to come? It was easy, I replied. She knew better and looked at me as if she realized that this was not entirely true. Okay, maybe not so easy. I flirted with your mother a little at first. Once I got her support, the two of us convinced your father. When I explained that this would be a very special day in his daughter's life, he relented. After that, even the army wouldn't have held him, I told her. I love you, she said, kissing me on the cheek. Little did she know that I had a few more surprises in store for that day. As time passed, I became more and more amazed at the interest in my photographs. In total, Tracy and I printed and framed 110 photographs in various sizes. In addition, she made 200 coffee table style hardcover books with 20 photographs each. Each book sold for $20. By three o'clock in the afternoon, there were only 60 books left and there was much more empty space on the walls than in the morning. Didn't I tell you, dear? Tracy whispered, walking up to me and grabbing my hand. If I know anything, it's what people like to hang on their walls. I could never imagine anything like this, I said, looking around. I, well, I guess I'm just amazed that people would actually pay that kind of money to have one of my photographs hanging in their home. Tracy smiled. I did the math. We had $35,000 worth of goods for the exhibition. We haven't finished the first day yet, and we've already sold two-thirds. I think we'll sell out everything by the end of tomorrow. I almost felt weak in my knees. Of course, we split the proceeds equally with Tracy, but even so, $17,000 was not that bad, especially considering how much fun we had while organizing it all. I smiled and kissed her. Honey, it's late and your parents may be tired, but there's something I want to do before they leave, I told her. She watched with interest as I ran into the back room where I hid my surprise. I returned to the gallery. I'm sorry, friends, I said, raising my voice to attract attention. I want to thank everyone for coming today and for all the flattering and generous comments you have made. You really know how to cheer up a man. This caused a slight laugh among those gathered. I also want to thank the wonderful Tracy Anderson for talking me into putting on this exhibition and for all the hard work she put into creating a truly memorable event. I also want to thank her assistant Angie, her brother Carl, and his wonderful wife Judy for their help. Everyone clapped. And I want to give a special thank you to one person without whom none of this would be possible, Mr. and Mrs. Todd Anderson. How did you? I had to stop for a minute while everyone applauded again.
I'm sure you've all seen the incredibly beautiful watercolor paintings that Mr. Anderson is so famous for. Well, it was one of his paintings that inspired this exhibition, and I'd like to give Mr. and Mrs. Anderson a small token of my gratitude. When I finished my little speech, I unwrapped their gift and handed it to Tracy's parents. I knew that Mr. Anderson recognized him instantly by the look in his eyes and the tear that rolled down his cheek. Oh, honey, look, it's just like your painting, Mrs. Anderson said, hugging her husband. Unable to speak due to his illness, he nodded quickly in agreement. I heard a few gasps and looked up to see they were coming from Tracy and Carl. This was the first time they saw it. This has been my secret project ever since Tracy stood on the beach with tears in her eyes, telling me about how her father painted those rocks. I took the photo during the day while Tracy was at the gallery and took it to the frame shop. I picked it up the Friday before the show and smuggled it into the gallery while Tracy was distracted. Nobody knew yet that I also made smaller versions for Tracy and Carl. I gave the driver of their car $50 to help get Mr. and Mrs. Anderson home with the photo. After that, it seemed like the last couple of hours flew by in an instant. Tracy summed up the day before we left. On the first day, we made $22,000 in revenue. After we locked the gallery, I suggested we have dinner in the city center since we were already there. We found a nice place on Walker Drive and enjoyed dinner, while my girlfriend complimented me on making her parents such a great day. She couldn't believe how I managed to secretly bring this huge print into her gallery without catching her eye, if she thought it was impressive. Wait, it was delicious, I remarked as we left the restaurant. Listen, such a beautiful night, and there will be a few more of these in the near future. What if we take a walk to the lake? She stood on her tiptoes and kissed me again. I took this as agreement. We walked to the rocks and watched as the full moon rose from the watery horizon and illuminated the path that trembled along the waves and ended at our feet. Tracy put her head on my shoulder and I put my arm around her and pulled her towards me. I just don't know how I can ever thank you for what you did for mom and dad, she sighed. Well, the time has come, I thought, taking a deep breath. Darling, have you ever thought about all the things we've shared since we knew each other? Did you share? No, I probably didn't think about it, but what? Well, I was thinking the other day, we share our love of art in almost any form. We share our love of Shakespeare. You share your deepest secrets and desires with me. We went on vacation together. She was starting to look at me a little strangely. I knew she was wondering what I was getting at with all this talk about sharing. I reached into my pocket and pulled out a tiny box. Darling, I have something I want to share with you. She put her hand to her lips in silent amazement as I dropped to one knee. My dear Tracy Anderson, I want to share the rest of my life with you, I said, handing her the ring. Oh my God, darling, yes, she almost screamed. Oh God, how I love you, my dear man, yes, 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 I will marry you. She leaned over and showered me with hugs, kisses, and tears of joy. I guess you could say it was a day I will never forget. The late evening was also very memorable, Tracy ensured that. On Sunday, the gallery was even more crowded than on Saturday. Carl and Judy were there again to help us. Thank God Tracy had thought to print the catalog, because by mid-afternoon we had very few actual prints left, and she was now taking orders for more. I was talking to one of my clients who told me that he had just ordered a large print for his office when I felt a light tap on my shoulder and heard a familiar voice. Hello, Dalton. I turned around and looked straight into the big brown eyes of the woman who had once been my world. Jin, I said a little heavily. I often wondered how I would feel if I met her again. I never hated her. I remember thinking at the time that if I could, it would be easier to deal with the pain. But now, seeing her again, I remembered that pain, but no longer felt it. Tracy did a great job replacing it with love. How are you? She asked, holding out her hand to me. I'm fine, Jin. How are you? She smiled slightly sheepishly, but ignored my question, looking around until her eyes landed on one of the last remaining large photos hanging on the side wall. I think you're doing very well. This is fantastic, Dalton your own show in a beautiful gallery in the city center. 
When did you start doing these things? At this point, Tracy came over to give me a sales update. She took my hand and kissed my cheek, then extended her hand to Jean, not knowing who she was, of course. Hello, madam. I see you have met the photographer. Have you already had a chance to look around? Sorry, but we have very little work left. However, we have catalogs on the table and we take orders. Um, honey, I decided it was better to interrupt her because she was just wasting her time. I noticed that Jean's face took on an expression as if she was about to be hit by a truck. This is Jean, my ex-wife. Jean, this is Tracy, the owner of this beautiful gallery and my fiancé. It was almost imperceptible, but I heard Jean's barely audible sigh. She looked at Tracy, then back at me. Oh, I, uh, congratulations, she said, unsuccessfully trying to put on a smile. Thank you, Tracy replied in her usual cheerful manner. I saw the pain on Jean's face. Apparently, there was no one in her life yet, and I had a strong feeling that she had come, hoping to revive the old spark. I noticed how her eyes were shining with moisture. Well, I'll go look around and look at your work, she said, using this as an excuse to turn away so that we wouldn't see her tears. I watched as she walked over to one of the remaining large photographs and began to examine it. I noticed how she was trying to discreetly take a napkin out of her purse and imperceptibly wipe her eyes. I felt Tracy pull my arm and lead me to a table on the other side of the gallery. She's still in love with you, you know that, right? She whispered. Yes, I noticed it myself, I replied. I looked at Tracy. She had a big heart, and I could see that she felt sorry for Jean. What should I do? I asked, answering her silent question asked with her eyes. Here, she said, taking the last album from the coffee table. Write something nice here and give it to her for old time's sake. I wasn't sure I wanted to do this, I didn't want to send the wrong message, but one look into my new woman's kind eyes and I knew I could be generous. I hope Jean takes it the way I intended as a parting gift. Dear Jean, we had many wonderful memories together. I wish you all the best and a future filled with happy moments. Dalton, how do you like it? I asked, showing Tracy what I had written. She leaned over and kissed me again. Wonderful. You're a good person, she said. That's why I love you. Will you come with me to present it? I asked. No, you will do it yourself. If I go, it might seem insincere. Okay, I replied, approaching Jean. She was still looking at the seascape and wiping her eyes when she thought no one was looking. Jin, she turned, still trying to smile. Listen, I want you to take this. We had a lot of good times together and, well, I just thought you might like it. She looked surprised when I offered her the book. She had almost given up trying to hold back her tears. They now flowed down her face as she read the inscription. Thank you, Dalton, she said, crying. I sincerely wish you nothing but happiness with your new bride. I say this with all my heart. I just wish it was me, she said, starting to sob. She pressed the book to her heart, stood on tiptoe and kissed me, then quickly walked towards the door. This was the last we saw or heard of Jean for several years. Tracy and I got married the following June. My buddy Jack was my best man. We both stood in front of the priest and watched as the most beautiful bride in the world walked arm in arm with her father, who was carried down the aisle by Tracy's brother, Carl. I doubt there was a single dry face in the room. No one knew how much time Mr. Anderson had left, and everyone was just glad that he was able to be a part of his daughter's wedding. For our honeymoon, we headed back to Monterey Bay. This time, in addition to capturing the most beautiful place on earth, where wind and sea meet sand, we're also back with several hundred shots of Fisherman's Wharf and Cannery Street. More than enough for another exhibition. Tracy knew what she was talking about when she said that the first exhibition would strengthen my business. Now I no longer had to look for new clients they found me themselves, and Dalton commercial photography was no longer a one-man business. I had to hire two more photographers, a graphic designer, and a secretary. Tracy and I continue to experiment with sex. In fact, it has become an integral part of our love games. More than once Tracy came to the gallery with a sore bottom. 
I especially love coming home after a hard day and finding my naked slave on her knees with a glass of whiskey in her hand and then of course doing her chores while I drink. Of course, this is strictly between us. It's been three years since I proposed to Tracy. A lot has changed since then. After returning from her honeymoon, Tracy organized another exhibition, and it went so well that she opened a second gallery in the northwest suburbs. It is much smaller, but also thriving. She also found a publisher who was happy to publish a book with my photographs, and it was also a success. Tracy's father passed away from his illness about a year ago. Her mother, bless her heart, cared for him until her last breath. Carl and Judy built a small apartment in the back of their house and moved it into their home. She has her own living room, bedroom, and kitchenette so she can maintain some independence and privacy. Of course, the most important thing was the birth of the sweetest baby God ever created, our daughter Taylor. She is six months old and looks more and more like her mother every day. I know some of you may be wondering what happened to Jean. Well, about a year ago, I happened to meet her father, and he told me that she was still working at Versington Industries and seemed to be doing well, at least in that part of her life. He admitted that he was worried about her. Jean registered on several dating sites. He saw her several times after dates and noticed marks on her body from ropes and blows. He said he prayed she would meet someone and settle down someday. Someone like me, he said. The weather was so beautiful the other day that Tracy and I put Taylor in the stroller and went for a long walk. Dalton, I heard as we passed a bench in the park. Tracy and I both looked and saw Jean. For a minute, I thought she was going to lose her composure when she saw Taylor. I immediately realized that she remembered our conversations about starting a family. She didn't even try to hide her expression of regret, but still managed to hold on and even asked to hold the baby. We let her talk more while she held our daughter in her arms. She told us that she had been promoted at work and that she was doing well. But although she tried to show contentment, there was a distinct sadness in her eyes. As we were about to leave, Jean noticed the silver necklace Tracy was wearing. Oh, Tracy, I really like your necklace, she said. Thank you, this is a gift from Dalton, Tracy said, leaning forward so Jean could get a better look at it. I would take it off so you could see it closer, but there is an inscription inside that I'm afraid is very personal and for my eyes only. Besides, it is locked, and only Dalton has the key. Suddenly Jean's eyes widened, and I knew she knew what it was. Is it locked? Is, is this a slave collar? She asked. Tracy smiled. She knew that Jin was aware of this lifestyle. Only a person who knew what it was could understand the meaning of this necklace. With a devilish grin, she looked at Jean and raised her eyebrows several times in rapid succession. Come on, master, she said, kissing me. It's time for us to go. I took Taylor from Jean and put her in the stroller. We said goodbye and continued our walk, leaving Jean sitting on the bench. I turned around and looked over my shoulder at Jean, who still had a look of shock on her face. End. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.